it's a stampede. Isn't it good to be in the house of the Lord today? Yeah. Boy, it's good to see you. you. You may have noticed there's a special insert in your bulletin. Avail yourself of this information, please, because we really want to see you in Sunday school. If you're not a, an, an attendee yet, of Sunday school, we'd love to see you. There's a list here of all the classes that are going on, and ladies, you may see there that starting July 1st, we're gonna have a brand new Sunday school class that is for the women, and that's gonna be tremendous. And then also, I'll be beginning my 12-week discipleship course. We'll begin on April 7th, which is the Sunday after Easter. And that's a really good class for any Christian, but especially if you're somewhat new and have questions. Maybe you're wondering, you know, just, just what the, the faith is all about. You have questions about the Bible. Maybe you're wondering what exactly a Baptist believes, what makes a Baptist church different from other sorts of churches. Those are the types of questions that will be answered in that class. So make plans now because we're coming up on on some good stuff. And also, we are searching for teachers. So as you are doing the nominating committee form, if you feel God calling you to maybe look into teaching Sunday school, we'd love to have you. There's the commercial, all right? So we'll be in Matthew chapter 12 today. That may seem unusual at first because we've been studying Jonah, of course. And Jonah is just four chapters long, and we did all four chapters. Ordinarily, when I preach this sermon series, because I've done series on Jonah before, it's just four installments. But the Lord started dealing with me, brother, on a fifth one and said, no, you're going one extra week. I got something else that I want to add in there. And I said, 10-4. So here we are in Matthew chapter 12, because the story of Jonah is not over. It's kind of interesting last week, right? We finished the book and it ends in a question. Jonah, should I not show mercy to these Ninevites? They don't know their left hand from their right. You all remember this. And it seems like the book of Jonah just kind of trails off. There, were, there was kind of a, a collective, huh, when we read that last week, that it just seems to plunge off a cliff. That's because there's one more piece to Jonah's story. It just takes place hundreds of years after the book of Jonah here in Matthew today. Because we're going to discover that what Jonah went through prefigured some important things that were going to occur later on. Jonah could not have known this at the time. But now we have the benefit of looking back and seeing, oh, okay, I see now this makes sense. It couldn't have made sense for Jonah in that day, but now it makes perfect sense to us. Because, of course, everything in the Scripture, I'm going to make a big statement here, but, but trust me. Everything in the scripture points one direction, and that is to Jesus. You, be, beginning with Genesis 1-1 all the way through Revelation, it is all about Jesus Christ, our Savior. We read the Old Testament and some of these things that went on, like the, like the Passover, for example, and many other wonders that God did. All are just big flashing road signs pointing toward the Messiah. Would you believe that what Jonah went through was exactly the same way? You're going you're gonna to really like this if you've been enjoying this series. Now, this is the last piece today. And then, of course, we're moving into Easter season. And it does come early this year. So, yeah, we're going to be talking a lot about the cross, a lot about the resurrection, a lot about the blood of Jesus. And, you know, I found over the years, brother, that uh, any time we're going to sing about the blood... The devil just hates it. He'll, he'll find a way to get a cell phone to go off or the video won't work or you know what I'm saying? There's always interference because the devil, the last thing he wants you to hear is that the blood of Jesus will cleanse you from your sins. That's the last piece of information he'd ever want you to know. So there's always something. So I bless God for that. I know what's going on. <laughs> so we're in Matthew 12 and we're going to start to read in verse 38 and you will see these nasty-hearted old scribes and Pharisees up to their old tricks, trying to find a way to trap Jesus in a, in a lie or in an inconsistency. They were always twisting his words, trying to, trying to trap him. And here they ask him, give us a sign. Give us a sign. It says in verse 38, Then some of the scribes and Pharisees answered, saying, Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. But he answered and said to them, 
An evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign, and no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. I told you he'd make a comeback <laughs> in the New Testament. He says, there's going to be no sign except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh will rise up in the judgment with this generation and condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and indeed a greater than Jonah is here. The queen of the south will rise up in the judgment with this generation and condemn it, for she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon, and, and indeed a greater than Solomon is here. All right. There's a mystery to it, right? I'm going to help us untangle that, but we need the help of the Holy Spirit first. So let's go to the Lord in prayer, and we will yield ourselves up just now to the teaching God has prepared for us. Would you bow with me? Father, today, as we are looking into your word, we see the sign indeed. We see that your word is a giant sign pointing right at the cross, where we need to be looking this morning, Father. So I pray that all distractions will cease. I pray, Father, that our minds might zero in, that we wouldn't be sitting here in church with our, our brains somewhere else doing something else, but instead we would be able to focus on your word. Sweet Holy Spirit, shed light on the word today that we might comprehend it. For this is somewhat of a complex passage, but we know, Lord, there is no truth in your word that is too complex for a believer to comprehend if we will just humble ourselves and say, teach me, O Master. So that is our cry today, Father. Teach us, we pray. Mold us like clay on the potter's wheel. Show us what the sign of Jonah is all about. In Jesus' name, amen. Have you ever asked God to give you a sign? I think last week I asked you if you've ever, if you've ever thrown a fit and been angry at God, and everybody would own up to that. You sense that maybe I'm trapping you, right? <laughs> have you ever asked God for a sign? I'd say if, if, we're, if we're being honest here, a lot of us have said that before, that I'll, I'll admit that at times in my life, I have asked God to show me something miraculous to, to confirm what he, has, what he has said so I could know his will or his direction in my life. Uh, maybe, and, and when we say we're seeking a sign, maybe, I don't know, we're, we're praying and a, a shooting star goes across the sky or some animal shows up or, you know, we're always, we're always on the lookout for, Lord, Lord, reveal yourself to me in some way that will be spectacular. Maybe, maybe even God will send an angel to speak, right? Now, some folks in the Bible did that. You may recall a guy named Gideon, way back in the book of Judges, Gideon, he put out a fleece. He said, Lord, I'm going to lay this fleece out on the ground, and if I wake up in the morning and all the ground's wet and that thing's dry, then I'll know you're you, and I'll believe you, and I'll follow you. So he comes out there in the morning, what happened? The ground was wet, and the fleece was dry. So Gideon said, all right, that's great. Now tonight, Lord, I'm going to lay out the fleece, <laughs> and if I get up in the morning and it's wet and the ground is dry, then I know you... And, and really what this did, God did show Gideon these signs, but I believe that it showed a little bit of a lack of faith on Gideon's part. He was immature and he was timid in the things of God, and God had appeared to him as an angel there and had said, Gideon, I, I want you to go defeat these Midianites, and Gideon said, who me? And then he goes in this whole repertoire of asking God for sign after sign after sign after sign. Really, what should he have done? He should have just taken God at his word. A lot of times, folks, when we ask God for a sign, God has probably already answered what you're asking right here in the Scripture. We just don't know what it says or where to look. You know, it, it may be that whatever you're going through in life, God has already spoken directly to it. Probably so. The truth is, you probably don't need a sign. You just need to get in the Word, and you just need to believe in God a little, little more. Uh, when, he, when he says something to you, that he's going to bring it to pass. So it wasn't a really positive thing in Gideon's world that he, he couldn't seem to take God at his word. And that's the problem with seeking signs from God. Uh, that's the problem with asking God for a sign is you are seeking God 
in the abnormal and in the extraordinary instead of seeking God in the everyday ordinary like we ought to. Okay, that flew right over some of y'all's heads. Let me repeat it. Let me try this again. <laughs> The problem is, a lot of times when we seek a sign, we're looking for God in the abnormal instead of the normal stuff of life. We're looking for God in the extraordinary. Show me some extraordinary sign, Lord, and then I will believe when in reality the mature Christian can spot God in the ordinary. The everyday stuff of life, when you can find God there, you're doing better than looking for signs. Because it, it, it would probably be easy for you if some miraculous sign appeared. You know, some angel appeared here with a flaming sword. You know, everybody would say, okay, yeah, sure, that's, that's I, I, I believe. But it's much harder to go live your life and be there in the drudgery of your workplace or to, or to be bored sitting somewhere. Or, you know, I had to go to the DMV the other day. I pray for you if you're going to the DMV, but can you find God in the DMV? You know, can you find God as you're waiting to see your doctor? Can, can you see the Lord in the ordinary stuff of life? That takes more Christian maturity than to say, Lord, show me some big sign. You get it? And God is in the ordinary and every day, isn't he? The problem is we lack the vision to spot him often within the everyday stuff of life. But that's when you really start to you really start to flow into the spirit of the Lord is when you realize, hey, I'm, I'm living my life and it's not all daisies and roses and I don't always feel turbocharged as a Christian, but I've got my eyes open to spot God even in the littlest details. You know, child runs up to you and gives you a hug and, 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 and you can recognize that in that is something of a hug from God for you. You know, that's, that's better than saying, Lord, send me a burning bush that I could look at and then I would believe. Because lots of people in the Bible who saw really dramatic, crazy stuff, believed for a minute and then ended up losing heart later on. So don't think for a second that just if you see a miracle that it'll make a, a steadfast believer out of you the rest of your life. No, the truth is you need to be able to find the miraculous in the everyday. Right? Because if you're only a worshiper when something extraordinary happens, you're not going to worship very often. If you're only a believer when something big and dramatic is happening in your life, you're going to find that you're not a believer for 90% of your life because most of life is just the boring old humdrum stuff. We've got to be able to find God there too. Amen, church? That, that's what it's all about. That's the maturity that I'm speaking of. Something truly extraordinary is when you can see God in the ordinary instead of always seeking for a sign. So we need to find him in the seemingly boring moments of life, just the regular old stuff. That's where we often miss his holy presence because we're waiting on something bigger to show up. But God is often in the still small voice, right? You remember when Elijah wanted a sign and there was a whirlwind and an earthquake and all kinds of stuff and God wasn't in any of it, but afterward, jo uh, Jonah, Elijah could hear him in a still, small voice. Little bitty. That's where God was. Truly, Jesus is God's sign. If you're looking for a sign, I've got great news for you. God has already provided the ultimate in signs for us it's the cross what Jesus has done for us on Calvary is the ultimate sign that we could ever see that God delivered and if you've been seeking a sign from God lately I'm not going to tell you you're wrong because honestly seeking God is always good but the truth is you've got to open up your spiritual eyes to see God around you all the time now, the, the, the Jews here, they wanted Jesus to prove his power. That's hilarious to me because I want you to look back in the same chapter, Matthew 12, in verse 22. Look at what Jesus had just done. Matthew 12, 22 says, Then one was brought to him who was demon-possessed. And this, this demon had rendered this guy blind and mute, and he healed him so that the blind and mute man both spoke and saw. 
And all the multitudes were amazed and said, could this be the son of David? They began to sense he's the Messiah. He just opened up this guy's eyes. This man could not speak, could not see, and now he can. And look what they say to him in verse 24. Now when the Pharisees heard about this, they said, this fellow does not cast out demons except by Beelzebub, the ruler of demons. In other words, church, he's out there performing signs, and even when, they did, even when he performed a miraculous sign in front of them, they said, he can cast out demons because he is a demon. These guys, they, they weren't after a sign because they wanted to believe. They were putting Jesus on the spot saying, if you're who you say you are, do something for us. Like he's a sideshow. Like he's a carnival act, right? Like, he, like he's a, a pony that's going to do some tricks. Jesus is above all of that, amen? I mean, they, they just wanted to see something, and they'd already seen. They knew exactly what he could do, but they wanted to put him on the spot. Sounds like, to me, the same temptation that Satan brought to Jesus. You remember studying temptation with me? The sermon series before this one? You remember, the devil came to Jesus and he said, if you're who you say you are, do this thing and that thing and this thing and prove it. Pharisees said the same thing. Give us a sign, Lord. We want to see something. It's interesting that they were goading him into a performance like the devil himself tried to do. It's funny that they would say that he was aligned with devils when in reality, they're the ones who are aligned with the devil. Plain to see, isn't it? Plain to see. Jesus had a simple response. He said, the only sign you're getting, <laughs> oh, I like this a lot, church. He says, the only sign you guys are going to get is the sign of the prophet Jonah. Now, we know all about this story of Jonah, don't we? We've been studying together. Some of you have been here all, all four weeks, read the whole book. We know Jonah's story. And Jesus told them, he said, this is going to be your sign. You guys get the sign of Jonah. And what was the sign of Jonah? It's very simple. Just as Jonah was in the belly of that fish until the third day, Jesus himself very soon was going to descend. Jesus was going to descend not into a fish, but according to this passage, into the very heart or center of the earth. Jesus was going to descend, buried in the ground, dead and gone to the realm of the dead. But brothers and sisters, just as Jonah re-emerged from that descent that he made to bring salvation to some Gentiles... Guess what Jesus was going to do? He was going to reemerge. They buried him, but he didn't stay there, did he? Up from the grave, he arose, my brother. <laughs> and he come up out of there, and that was the sign. He says, this is the sign I'm going to give you, is that there's going to be a man who lays down his life, and then he's going to have the power to take it up again. Just as Jonah was in the fish, he said, and then he came out on the third day. The Son of Man is going to go to the heart of the earth. And then he is going to come back and bring salvation to all people, including we Gentiles. <laughs> Hallelujah. Oh, man. I want to point out here, by the way, that Jesus, in speaking on it, validates the book of Jonah. You see what I'm saying? Jesus speaking on the book of Jonah validates the book of Jonah. He doesn't say it was a fairy tale. He does not say it was a parable. He does not say it was something allegorical. In fact, Jesus treats it like history, like reality, because guess what? It was history and it was reality. A fish really did swallow Jonah. And if you don't believe the book of Jonah, Guess what? That means you don't believe Jesus. Mm-hmm. Getting on your toes? To question the authenticity of the book of Jonah is to question the authenticity of Christ himself. Because if Jonah is a lie, Jesus promoted it as history 
then we make Jesus out to be a liar and God cannot lie. That was a side trip. Now think back to our friend Jonah. He couldn't have known, could he? He could not have known when he was in that torture, that when, he was, when he was in the fish, in his time it simply seemed like this awful situation. I'm being eaten by this creature, but God prepared the fish, not only to change Jonah's heart, but to prefigure and demonstrate what Christ would later do. In other words, what Jonah went through showed something, Debbie, again, we put God in a box, right? And his thoughts are way out here. Jonah had to have been thinking in the box. I've been eaten by fish. I am miserable. This hurts. This makes no sense. Where is God when the bigger picture was what he was going through in some ways demonstrated the resurrection of Jesus. He couldn't have known. He couldn't have known. And you know why that excites me? That excites me because sometimes incomprehensible things happen in my life that I do not understand. Y'all ever been ate by the fish? He's ate me a few times. And when I was in there, I said, God, where are you? You have left me. You have dropped me. You have abandoned me. And I did not know, as Jonah could not have known, that greater purpose was being served. Jonah couldn't have known it in his day, and indeed it wasn't even known until hundreds of years later that what he went through was a symbolic picture of the death and resurrection of Jesus. Imagine if we could go back and tell him that. It might ease his suffering a little bit, right? In just the same way, I'm here to tell you this morning that what you're going through, there's a bigger picture you don't see the fullness of today. And you can take comfort in that, knowing that you're not the first. Amen? You're not the first to not understand the trial that they're going through. You're not the first, you won't be the last. There have been zillions of people who have said, where is God? I wonder how many times my circumstances didn't make any sense to me, and I complained on God or whined about it, never realizing that God sees the very biggest picture. And my brain sees only my circumstances and says, poor little old me. Help us, Lord. <laughs> I almost want to go back in time and hug him, don't you? Uh, Y'all don't like Jonah as much as I do. <laughs> Y'all are like, no, he deserved it. Yeah, he had it coming, that's for sure. But I almost want to go back in time and hug him and say, Jonah, my friend, this is bigger than you can possibly know. Trust God. Now, this part is astonishing. You like that? I told you all that to get to this. Now, this part is astonishing. If you've ever wondered whether the Ninevites were truly sincere in their repentance. If you've ever wondered whether those Ninevites really stuck with it, if the preaching of Jonah really made a, a difference in their life, look at what Jesus reveals. He says in verse 41, the men of Nineveh will rise up in the judgment with this generation and condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonah and indeed a greater than Jonah is here. <laughs> you got to picture it, okay? Someday in the future, we do not know when, but at the end of all things, the billions of people who have lived will all be gathered before the great white throne of God. And if you could picture it in your head, I know we can't really picture God, but he's there and he's on his throne. And here comes every person who ever lived to the judgment. And it says that when... The, the, the people of the time of Jesus, when they come forth to be judged, that generation that rejected him, that he came for and they said, no, we don't want you. When they come before God for the judgment, it says the men of Nineveh will stand up. Can you imagine? Those guys got saved, y'all, is what I'm telling you. They're going to be on the good side at the judgment, and those Ninevites are going to stand up and say, Boo! 
<laughs> They're going to say, we believed. Uh, God sent us Jonah and we believed that. You had Jesus there with you and you didn't believe him? What is wrong with you hardheads? Can you imagine? They're going to boo that generation at the judgment. And the Ninevites will have their day. <laughs> Isn't that cool? And then it says the queen of Sheba will be there too. Remember she, she traveled to see Solomon and get his wisdom? It says the queen of Sheba, she will be there and she too will condemn this generation because she believed based on what Solomon said and a greater than Solomon is here. That's going to be a sight to see, isn't it? Those, those guys who rejected Jesus on that day, they're going to get eggs thrown at them at the judgment by the Ninevites. Now that's a joke, y'all. I saw, everyone's, what eggs? That's not in here. Yeah, I know. That's your preacher. But this cracks me up because I, I, I see that for this generation, but the serious business here is that we're in the midst of an evil and adulterous generation now that is rejecting Jesus. What do you think the Ninevites will have to say to this current crop of Americans when we all get to the judgment. You think there may be a few boos that come out of the Ninevites at the way we had such prosperity, such ease of life, so, so many good things, so many rights, so many things, and we threw it down the garbage disposal? Right now, America is rejecting Jesus as well just like that generation did. And if they're not gonna escape, I promise you this generation will not escape either. Because on that day, when you're approaching that great white throne, there is no do-over. There is no continue screen where you go back to the beginning and try the stage again. There is no rewinding it. There is no saying, oh, now I see there's God. Oh, I, I believed in you all. No, no. On that day, it's game over, and that is it. Today is the day to repent. Today is the day to choose Jesus. Because I don't want to be on the other side of the booze of the Ninevites. I want to be sitting on the same side they're sitting on. Because they believed what Jonah said, and they repented, and they were real because they're going to be in heaven. And only those who repent and believe in Jesus are going to be in heaven. That's the gospel truth, church. I, I know that, that today, that's, that's what our, our generation that we're in wants everybody to believe is that everybody's just going to skate by. Everybody's going to go to heaven because we're all basically good. That's a horrible lie, church. From the pits of hell, it's a lie. Designed to keep people from repenting and trusting in the righteousness of Jesus instead of their own righteousness. Church, we have no righteousness on our own. None of us are going to good old boy our way through the pearly gates. There is only one way, and that is to see the sign of Jonah. To see that our Savior descended into the depths of the earth and then ascended on the third day. Victorious over death, to lead us to be victorious over death. We must choose Jesus today. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna put it, I'm gonna boil it all down for you right here. Stop asking God for signs and believe the sign you already have. Stop asking God for signs until we believe that sign right there. Until we're sold out to that sign, don't go asking God, oh, send me an angel, send me a shooting star, send me a clap of thunder, send me a lightning bolt, because he's already revealed his heart to you. He's just waiting on us to get real about it. The cross, the empty grave, Jesus, that's the sign. And as we move into Easter time, man, oh man, let us lift high the sign for our times so that everybody can see that the crucified, dead, and risen Savior, that he welcomes all today while it is still the day of salvation. Let's close with a song.
Because the Ninevites are going to have their day, aren't they? <laughs> oh, man. Thank you, Jesus. 414 is him softly and tenderly. Please turn there in your hymnals. We're going to close this service with a chance to respond to the gospel as you've heard it today. If you've never repented of your sins and come to the cross and received eternal life from Jesus, what are you waiting for? What are you waiting for? Come today. As you find that hymn, hang on to it and let's go before the Lord in prayer. Father, we want to acknowledge right now that what we have heard today is the truth, not only for our times, but for every time, that we must accept the sign that you have provided, and that is the sign of Jesus himself. Father, I pray that if there's anybody here today who would be on the wrong side of the judgment, that they would realize their error and come to receive you today. Sweet Holy Spirit, you are moving in this place on many people. Whew. Feel the conviction that comes to your heart when the king is in the house. Let him have his own way with you. Father, I just want to pray that you would pour out your presence, your love, your power upon all who are here. Those who suffer, those with questions, those who need salvation, those who are discouraged. I pray, Father, that you would come with that, that living water, Father, and just give us all the, the refreshing drink that we need to, to go out into the world this week and to serve you, to find you in the ordinary instead of the extraordinary sign. So in just a few moments, the invitation is this. If you're here today and you've never made Jesus the Lord of your life, you need to be saved. Again, you're not going to get there through any other God, any other religion. God has provided just one door. And that is Jesus himself. And if you will come to him today, he will say to you exactly what he said on the, on the cross to the thief next to him. Today, you will be with me in paradise. That's all it takes is crying out to the master, Lord, save me. And he'll do it. But you cannot do it secretly. The scripture says that if you deny Jesus before men, that he'll deny you before the father. But if you confess him before men, he'll confess you before the father. So in just a few moments, I'm going to invite you to make your way down the aisle. Find, find your pastor here. We're going to pray together. And very publicly and in a very real way, you're going to experience Jesus for the very first time. You're going to know why the rest of us are so excited. You're going to know why the rest of us love to serve God. Because once he has cleansed your soul, there is nothing that matches it in this world. You're going to be born again today. But do not delay, do not say no, do not put it off, because we're not guaranteed a tomorrow. Again, Father, we thank you so very much for this church. We thank you for all that has occurred here today. And I pray, Lord, if anybody here today needs you, this will be their moment. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to stand together, church. We're going to sing our final hymn very quietly, very reverently. And as we sing, if you need to receive the Lord Jesus, the, the map is clear and laid out for you. You come today in Jesus' name. Let us sing.